Misha here, and this is one I've been kind of thinking of redoing. One of my very first, maybe it was even my very first airplane videos on this channel was on Japanese modern jets, for example the F-1 and the F-2. <clears throat> and while I will never be great at aiming a video camera, because blind, you know, what can you do? Maybe I have improved a little since I did that. And also that was kind of a general video. So I thought I would focus today specifically on the Mitsubishi F2. Specifically, we have this new model from Hobby Master. This is kind of an interesting model. This is the XF2B, one of the two prototypes, two-seaters, that was built, along with two of the XF2As. So I thought we'd look at this and get a bit more into the history. And from my original video, I brought out my F2A. This one's in a pretty lightly loaded configuration, kind of more of a patrol style. And I still have my F2 B, which is in more of a training configuration with no uh, ordnance, just uh, fuel tanks. But that's okay because I ended up going with the XF2B that has all the weapons. Hobby Master also makes a version without ordnance, but I figured this would be kind of interesting. And I'm glad I did because it's my most heavily armed. And this aircraft is current in the Japanese Air Self-Defense Force and often nicknamed the Viper Zero and the Viper comes from the F-16 and the Zero comes from the classic A-6M from Mitsubishi. Now there's a lot of politics in this aircraft especially 1980s politics. Just to kind of recap a little bit, in 1981 Japanese military officials and uh, defense industries wanted is first started thinking about adopting a new developing a new aircraft to replace the F1. Not exactly an obsolete plane at that point, but technology had progressed quite a bit in the last 15 years. This was kind of tabled for a bit, you know, design studies, but finally in 1985 a feasibility study for a Japanese a domestically designed replacement was conducted. They looked at it, but then in 1986 and stuff, that's when the politics really gets involved. While Japan, especially its own uh, defense contractors and all that, argued that they really needed to do this to continue to develop their abilities to design and manufacture, as well as they'd had several successes with aircraft not just the F-1, but the T-4, and they'd also manufactured the F-15J under license, and of course before that the F-4 Phantom. So they thought they were ready to try to design a modern jet. Okay. But Americans, at least some in the American government and aviation industries, didn't like this. They said, no, we need to do a, a joint American Japanese project and it, they knew that Japan was not going to just buy American planes they had a habit of if not designing their own aircraft at least building their own okay so they knew this but they argued that if Japan made its own aircraft domestically it would be inferior to Western options and it could weaken Japan's uh, position in the world, its defense of itself, thus requiring more from America, yada yada, Cold War. It was kind of a back and forth, but then in 1987, that spring, the so-called Toshiba Kongsberg scandal became public, in which Toshiba was found to have sold machinery, I think it was some type of milling equipment, to Soviet Russia uh, against uh, international sanctions. So they, they did a no-no. This 
on top of an already perceived trade deficit between America and Japan, really put Japan in a, in a bad position, and they kind of had to, to knuckle under. At least that was the perception. So in October of that year, it was announced that, that there would be a, a, basically a joint project to develop a new fighter for Japan. And in November of 1988, a Memorandum of Understanding of Intention was signed basically between General Dynamics and Mitsubishi, in which General Dynamics would share the technology around the F-16, Mitsubishi would share its own technology in certain fields, for example radar, and they would work together, and at that time it was considered to be about a 55-45 split in favor of Mitsubishi, although obviously not by a whole lot. But this um, wasn't the most popular move in either country. People on both sides complained. Some in America said that it would give Japan a leg up in the aerospace industry and they might eventually compete against American manufacturers. And those in Japan, of course, didn't like the idea of paying licensing to America and sharing their most cutting-edge tech with America free of charge and just basically not being able to do their own thing, you know, having to kind of do what America wanted them to do. It went back and forth. Different parts of the governments were in favor, other parts weren't. Well, as soon as the new Bush administration came in, they ordered a review, or as they called it, clarification of the original agreement and the Japanese government was not happy about this they thought this was America trying to renegotiate at the 11th hour or even back out and they weren't wrong but again they're still kind of in a touchy position so in April of 1989 a new agreement slightly altered it's technically still the same agreement because it's the White House but yeah, it is announced that it basically gives a few more benefits to America. Well, in June, the Congress ratifies this, although it went on record as basically doing it under duress, not being very happy with it. And likewise, in Japan, many were not happy, including a couple of resignations around the same time in their government. Nevertheless, despite all this... The project went forward, and work began on the FSX program in 1990. And that's where our F2s, all uh, three variants here, came from. So without, with, the, with the kind of politics BS out of the way, what kind of fighter do we have, and was it worth all this trouble? The F-2, originally known as the SX-3, and then the XF-2, was actually based on a design from the 1980s that General Dynamics had, known as the F-16 Agile Falcon. This was an enlarged, more modern, more capable version. But it never really went much of anywhere at the time. But it became the starting point when they were designing the new fighter with Mitsubishi. And they would update it, modernize it, and integrate a lot of Japanese tech. It's actually quite famous for having the first active electronic search radar in an aircraft. Later this would be in planes like the F-22 Raptor, but this had it first. But for this new advanced radar, it has a longer and wider nose than an F-16. It can also carry quite a bit of ordnance, as you can see on this one here. It can carry four air-to-air -air missiles, short range, like AIM-9 Sidewinder, and then it can also carry four 
other missiles or bombs or guided weapons. Plus, it has room for up to three fuel tanks and even a couple of spots on the chin for a uh, pod of some type. Its wing is about 25% larger than on an F-16, and normally this would give it more weight and thus degrade performance, but Mitsubishi pioneered some technologies and composites that gave it strength but made, a, made the wing lighter. This would have uh, quite a few benefits as far as payload and range endurance and it even had a bit of a uh, stealth application so much so that the technology was shared with the US per the agreement. It would also have a larger air intake. It would have a larger tail. It had a new canopy which is more modern, gave better visibility and it had new multifunction color displays, three of them, and many other Japanese systems besides. So even though it is an F-16 derivative, it's pretty different as far as dimensions and, and all of that. It also had a drogue parachute, which some F-16s have, but the American ones did not tend to have and things of that nature. It was also fitted with a 20 millimeter cannon of Japanese origin. Well, General Dynamics was folded into Lockheed Martin and the eventual manufacturing split was 60-40 but there were tons of subcontractors on both sides including Kawasaki and Japan but final assembly was done by Mitsubishi in Japan although many of the parts were made originally in the USA by Lockheed Martin and others. Now, even before the first test flight, which was on October 7th, 1995, the plane was again controversial in Japan because it was expensive. The idea was the more they bought, the cheaper they would be per unit, but they were looking at costs and whatnot, and there were several overruns, and it was just obviously more expensive than a modern F-16, like a Block 50. So this led to some complaints. Now, after the first successful test flight, the Japanese government authorized an order of 141 aircraft. However, by the end of 19, excuse me, 1995, this was already reduced down to 130. And by doing this, the cost per aircraft went up, understandably. Between that time and the late 90s, there would be a total of four prototypes made. Again, two XF-2As, single-seaters, and two XF-2Bs, which this is here. They would be tested armed and unarmed and, and whatnot. And the planned service date was 1999. However... That new fancy composite wing structure gave some problems with stability, gave some problems with durability, so it actually delayed the first ones going into service. Not too bad, at least by like F-35 standards. The first ones went into Japanese air self-defense service in 2000. But there were other production delays, supply delays, budget concerns, so in 2004, the order was again decreased to 98, from 130 to 98. And this number included the four prototypes, so this guy here. Thus, 94 production models. And uh, of those, Mitsubishi would continue to deliver, their, deliver them to the Air Self-Defense Forces with the final member of the fleet served up on September 27th 2011 so production of the serial aircraft took just over a decade 
which means they were producing roughly nine and a half a year. And Mitsubishi has gone on record as saying, that's it, that's the end of the production run. Pretty, uh, yeah. Interesting start to an aircraft. So, what about its specs and uh, service? Well, while the XF2 is the new one here, I thought let's put the original F2A on the stand since this is the quintessential fighter version, fighter interceptor, that's used by Japanese Air Self Defense Force. Like I said, they were going into widespread use in the early 21st century. Overall, we're about 51 feet long. We have a wingspan of between 35 and 36 feet, depending on if we have our missiles on the wingtips or not. We have a max speed at sea level of about Mach 1.1, or at high altitudes of about 1.7. It's not the fastest in the world, but that's not what Japan needed. And we could get up to about 59,000 feet, give or take. We have quite a few hard points, if you really think about it. It can carry about 8,000 kilograms in ordnance. We've got the ability to carry all kinds of weapons, we can carry uh, four air-to-air -air missiles for defense, and we can carry four other types, including anti-shipping missiles, free-fall bombs, guided bombs like JDAM. Uh, we can also carry sparrows for defense if we need to. We can carry up to three external fuel tanks for increased range, and we can carry various targeting pods. And again, we have an internal 20 millimeter cannon just in case. And the standard is, of course, a one seat fighter. Although the two seater is fully weapons capable, fully combat capable. And this is, well, designed for defense, be it against ground targets or naval targets, which are more of a concern for Japan, being an island nation. And of course, air-to-air -air interception, but they're not designed for offensive purposes. Not at all. And really, the standard um, F-2B here is the same, except it's primarily used for training, instruction. But again, like I said, it is fully combat uh, combat capable too. So if it needs to, it can do that. And to wrap things up, let's put the F2B on the stand. Again, mostly used for training. The F2 has had a relatively quiet career, which is pretty much what you want out of a self-defense aircraft, but not without some incidents. Unfortunately, in 2007, it experienced its first crash in service. It was an F-2B, like this one here. On a training flight, it uh, crashed. Turns out it was due, due to faulty, bad, or improperly installed wiring. Luckily, both the pilot and well, I should say the trainee pilot and the instructor ejected and were safe and sound. And then in 2011, because this is Japan we're talking about, 18 of the F-2s were damaged during a major earthquake. And of those, 13 were repaired, which, which took some time, a couple of years. And five were just written off. They were just too badly damaged and just they were salvaged for what parts they could and, and that's it. Then in 2013 they had a little excitement. Early that year, a couple of Russian SU-27s 
entered into the edge of Japanese airspace. It was uh, the Kuril Islands, kind of disputes that go back a long ways. But anyway, Russia claims that, you know, that's not clearly Japanese territory. Japan, of course, says they are. Anyway, uh, Japan scrambled four F-2As to intercept. They gave them a verbal warning to get out of Japanese airspace. And they took a picture for the Sunday Morning Times. Russia, far from apologizing, claimed that they had every right to be there. And Putin's Russia being Putin's Russia, later that year in August, two Tupolev bear bombers again entered into Japanese airspace, this time much more in the heart of Japan, towards one of the southern islands. And uh, again, the F-2 was sent to intercept and, and drive them off. They didn't stay very long, but it was definitely no grounds to say that they were in disputed airspace or over disputed water. This was very clearly Japanese territory. So after this, and after the aircraft were repaired from the earthquake, Moving into 2014, uh, the fleet was 61 F-2As in service and 21 F-2Bs. So, that's what's still in active service. As far as I know, the number is about the same now, although a couple have been retired and a couple lost. For example, last year, 2019, there was yet another crash during a training flight of an F-2B. But again, luckily, the ejection system worked properly, and both occupants, both crew, were safe. And so while production is over for the Mitsubishi F2, the Viper Zero, which has got to be one of the coolest plane names, they will probably remain in JD, excuse me, Japanese Air Self-Defense Service for some time. Although they are starting to acquire the F-35 Lightning II. So they still have the, uh, the F-15J. Although the original F-4 EJ that they were using has been officially retired. Actually quite recently, but yeah. And there you have it. Kind of an uneventful life after all the politics, but so it goes. And again, that's kind of the fate of modern Japanese aircraft. And again, th this one here, the, the F-2B I have is a training, so it doesn't really have any ordnance. And the, the F-2A is uh, more in a patrol arrangement, not fully armed to the teeth. That, plus not having a lot new to get excited about. Is why I went ahead and picked up the uh, XF-2B here. And I got the one with all the cool armament. Again, they have one that just has bare pylons if you want that. But my attitude was simple. You can always just uh, take the ordnance off this if you don't want. And everything that it came with is here except for the centerline fuel tank because I can't install that and still have the, uh, the stand on. But I do have the lightning or targeting pod and total of eight missiles and the two fuel tanks. And the cockpits on these are kind of neat. It's not one where it's you have two and you can plug in either open or closed. On all three of these, it's actually hinged, which is neat. It, it kind of pulls up and hinges like it really does on an F-16. So I think that uh, it's pretty neat how Hobby Master has made this. And uh, yeah, it's pretty much all metal, at least the, the wings and the main fuselage. Now the tail, because it has so many little antennae and stuff on it, that is polymer plastic. And the very end of the nose, of course, would be, but... Everything else is metal, and it seems like Hobby Master really does a good job with their uh, Japanese aircraft. Can't imagine why. 
but I've always been happy with their Japanese offerings. And they do, in fact, as far as I know, they're the only maker to do the F1 and F2, at least in one 72 scale diecast. They also do an F4, which maybe I'll show you one day. And they do a couple of F15Js and DJs and pretty much the whole modern fleet. Now, if someone would just do a T1, <laughs> that would be pretty cool. Uh, they have a T2 and a T4, but uh, no, uh, no T1s. Kind of sad. But like I said, I wanted to cover this again in more detail versus my first video. I do hope I got something on camera for you. If not, I apologize, but I hope you at least enjoyed chatting about uh, Japanese aircraft. Let me know what you think. If you could, like, share, and subscribe. This is Misha, and I'll catch you very soon next time.